Thank you very much. Let's turn to John chapter 19 and verse 30. John chapter 19 and verse 30. The Bible reads, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. I invite the church, wherever we are, to kneel down so that we can give a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you for the blessing of the day, the blessing of the Sabbath that is before us. We want to thank you, Lord, for you have given us a man who is going to break the bread of life today in the form of Brother Horn. You have once used him before. We want to believe and to trust that you are going to fill him with your Holy Spirit this afternoon as he is going to continue to bless us with your word. Continue to bless us as a church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Over to you, my elder, for the divine service. Over to you for our divine service, Mr. Horn. Well, it's good to be a part of Tableview Church this morning. Um, it is my home church. It is the church where I went to when I became a Seventh-day Adventist 14 years ago. And I do see one name that stands out for me. I tried to see, you know, who do I recognize? Maybe I've I've lost some names, but I see actually now two names. Robert Zeely, it's good to see you, even though I don't see you. And then Arthur, I see your name is there too. Um, it's good, good to know that some of the people are still there. Obviously, some of the faces, if I were to see your face, I would recognize it, but I maybe forgot the name. Forgive me, I am getting older even though when I think I'm still young. But it's good to be a part of the church again and to be a part of Tableview Church. As I said, it's been 14 years um, since I became a Christian and Tableview Church was my home church. So I'm glad to hear you guys are still planning to build the church. I know the plans was already there back then and it's good to know that you guys are going to go ahead. Um, it feels a little bit awkward when I say things and I don't hear anyone. So if you want to say an amen or you want to say it's good to hear your voice or anything like that, I don't know how you guys work. So I can know at least I'm talking to someone out there and that you guys are hearing me. Can I get the, I the, can I get the, um, the presenter view, please? Okay, can you guys see the screen? Or must I press play? No, it is sharing. Can everyone see it? Amen. 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 Okay, so this is our ministry, the preparation ministry. And the gods really inspired us to do a YouTube channel. And God is really blessed that from April since lockdown started till now we've also almost got 3,000 subscribers and God's really blessing the messages and we are privileged to stand in his service and to do his work on a full-time basis that is what I do I do his work my, my first sermon I ever preached was in Tableview Church it was a year and a half after I became a Seventh day Adventist. I wasn't supposed to preach. Another friend of mine would have given her testimony. I would have shared something short. I mean, what do I know after a year and a half? A year and a half before that, I was still drunk on the streets, the table view in Bloberg Strand, going to the clubs, etc. And here that my friend said to me, the day before the the or the, the testimony that she is going to give, 
that her voice is gone. She sent me a message and I need to take the whole divine service. Man, I was so nervous. I'm like, what? What can I tell the saints? You know, back then I still thought everyone were angels. You know, these, this is the truth. Everyone is perfect, etc. Um, but we know it's not always the truth. And that day when I preached, another guy arrived at church that doesn't didn't belong to Temple View Church, and he had his camera in his car, and he decided to film my first sermon. And that's the start of a journey of doing sermons and using television, using internet by using cameras to preach the gospel to the world. So since then, that has been doing in my life. So that's my beautiful wife, as you can see on screen, Chantel. Uh, we are 10 years here, and we've got two boys, John and Matthew. One is five, the other one turning three next month. And we are excited for what God is doing currently during this pandemic. Okay, um, we, it looks like we are losing Brother Hon. Can we maybe just, I don't know whether he's able to hear us, and if he's able to, maybe to just ask him to reboot his device and then come back on. In the meanwhile, we can ask for a song from the chorister. Okay, I guess we will have a song while we wait. Okay, so we can just open up our hymnals and we will sing 133, Walking with God. Oh, let me walk with thee, my God, as Enoch walked in days of old, place thou my trembling hand in thine, and sweet communion with me hold. In though the path I may not see, yet Jesus led me walk with thee. 
I cannot dare to walk alone. The tempest ages in the sky. A thousand snares beset my feet. A thousand foes a lurking night. Still thou the raging of the sea. O Master, let me walk with thee. If I may... Is he back or should I continue? I am back, yes. I'm back. Okay. Okay, I think it's because I shared the screen sometimes when I do Zoom too and the screen is shared, then suddenly I can see poor connection. So what did you guys hear and what you did? what did you not hear? Or what did you guys hear? Where last did you hear me? Did you guys hear me explain our ministry in the beginning? Um, I heard you explain your work that you've chosen for your life. Mm -hmm. And I heard you talk about your children, who's, one is having a birthday next month. Okay. So let's just start the, the sermon then over, and I will not share the screen. You guys can just follow in your Bible. So the cross and the seven last plagues. Why won't we receive the seven last plagues? This is what we're going to answer this morning. Why you and I will be protected and what are the two reasons we will be protected in the last days when it comes to the seven last plagues? And it's interesting to note when Jesus hung upon the cross, he had seven sayings, seven things that he said upon the cross, exactly seven. The first thing he said is in Luke 23, 34 which says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. So the Bible says that Jesus' first words is directly related to those who do not deserve or will not see the kingdom. And Jesus' heart towards them is that God would forgive them, for they do not understand what they are doing. His second saying on the cross is Luke 23, 43. And this is where the thief said to him to remember him. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you on this day, you will be with me in paradise. So the first saying is related to those who do not deserve salvation, those who are wicked. But his second saying is in relation to those who have the faith like a mustard seed, who takes one step towards him. And he accepts them just the way he, they are and promises them eternal life. That's the second saying upon the cross. You would see that the first three sayings of Jesus on the cross has to do with his relationship with humanity. The last four sayings on the cross all has to do with his relationship with his father. John 19, 26 and 27, Jesus' third saying. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and a disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So Jesus firstly thinks of those who do not deserve salvation. As he said, I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Then he shows how he can save a sinner in the dying moments of his life, the thief of the, on the cross. And then he turns to his own people, his own family, his mother and the apostle John. And he says to them, I still care about you even within the darkest hour of my life. The fourth saying of Jesus, Jesus now turns to his relationship with his father. Matthew 27 and verse 47. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here Jesus now focused on his relationship with his father and he understands because of the sin of the world being placed upon him and a separation has taken place because God cannot live in the presence of sin. God the Father within the darkness around the cloud, in the, around the cross, he's right there, has to turn his face away from his son. And the son feels the separation. That's the fourth saying. The fifth saying, 
John 19 verse 28. If, if I do break up and you guys cannot hear me, please feel free to interject any one of you. I can hear you. So just tell me we can't hear you and I will say it over. So John 19 verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. This is a spiritual thirst more than what it was a physical thirst. This thirst was for a thirst of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said in John chapter 7 that anyone who thirsts, come to me and I will give you water. And that water he was referring to as the Holy Spirit. You can also read it in Isaiah 44, 44 and verse 3 where the Bible says, If anyone is thirsty, come to me, I will give you living waters. And then once again it says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. So here, Jesus in his first two sayings in relation to the Godhead longs for the presence of the Godhead. He longs for the presence of his Father, the comfort of his Father, and he longs for the presence of the Holy Spirit. The next saying, John 19 verse 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Here Jesus points to the fact that he has finished the work that God has called him to do. John 4.34 is my favorite scripture in all of the Bible. I know many times people would choose a scripture like Isaiah 41 verse 10, which is a powerful scripture, in relation to the promises of God, where God says, Fear not, for I am with you. I will uphold you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, etc. But mine is John 4, 34, where Jesus actually shows us our mission in life when he said, why are we here? And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Doing God's will and finishing his work is why you and I are here in this life. But whatever we take on in life. Whatever our job description, doesn't matter what we do in life, it must be based upon these two principles. Whatever I do, whatever I watch, whatever I listen to, must be in line with God's will. And whatever I do in my work, the goal is to finish God's work so that we can go home. And Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, meaning I have finished, I have accomplished the work that God has called me to do. And therefore he said, it is finished. Then Luke 12, 46, the final saying of Jesus, the ultimate surrender to the will of God is explained in the scripture. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. In this text, we see the ultimate full dependence and surrender of Christ upon the Father. Spirit of prophecy says to us that Jesus did not see beyond the cross. The cross for him was the end. There was no light in the tomb because of the separation between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But here Jesus trusted in the Father's character heretofore shown him. He could only trust as to the character that God has displayed to him before he is dying upon the cross. And Jesus trusted that character and he said, into your hands I commit my fate. I commit my future, whether I would be resurrected or not, into your hands. Jesus raised himself, but he could only do it based upon the command of the Father. The Father had to approve the sacrifice and send the angel and say, go and tell my son that he can resurrect himself. And Jesus raised himself. As Jesus said, you break down this temple, I'll raise it up again with power within himself, as he is fully divine, as he is the resurrection and the life. So here we have the seven sayings of Jesus upon the cross. And we will get back to this as we would see that this is actually the first reason why you and I won't receive the seven last plagues. Now let's quickly run through the seven last plagues. The book of Revelation is my favorite book in all of the Bible. So I love preaching on this book. The first plague we find in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 2. It is the verse where it talks about the loathsome sores that will come upon the people. This is the same plague that hit Israel, in Egypt, the sixth one, in Exodus 9 verse 9, where it says that boils broke out upon the people. 
So that's the first plague. There will be boils or sores that will break out upon the people. If you're to remember the story of Job, it's almost like he had that plague. He, he was itching 24-7, the boils and the sores that he had. The second plague, Revelation 16 and verse 3. The sea becomes blood. This affects traveling. It affects fishing. It, it, it affects so many things in this world. The second trumpet of Revelation chapter 8 and verse 8 also talks about the sea turning into blood. This is also the same as the first plague in Egypt in Exodus 7, 17 to 21, when Moses and Aaron turned the waters to blood. The third plague is Revelation 16, 4 through 7. Where the waters, the drinking water, now turns to blood. This affects everything because water is life. Nothing would be able to grow. And we won't be able to drink water if we're not in God, of course. The second trumpet, Revelation 18.10, also talks about the waters turning to blood. And this is also, again, the same as the first plague in Egypt, where the waters were turned to blood. The fourth plague, Revelation 16, verse 8 and 9. The sun scourges men. This is the same as the fourth trumpet of Revelation chapter 8 and verse 12. Now, what would be the result of the sun being so hot that it scourges people? Not only will it affect people, but it will affect livestock and it will affect crops. We read this in Joel chapter 1 verses 10 through 12 and 17 through 20. Spread of Prophecy quotes these verses in relation to this plague. And it says, Joel chapter 1, 10 through 12 and 17 through 20. The field is wasted, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined, the new wine is dried up, the oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished, meaning there is no food. The vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered, the pomegranate tree the palm tree also and the apple tree all the trees of the field are withered surely joy has withered away from the sons of men because now they don't have water and they don't have food the seed shrivels under the clots storehouses are in shambles meaning factories where the food are stored will be in shambles barns are broken down for the grain has withered how the animals groan the herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of the sheep suffer punishment. O oh Lord, to you I cry out. For fire has devoured the open pastures. And a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The sun scourging will cause these flames to burn. The beasts of the field also cry out to you. For the water brooks are dried up. And fire has devoured the open pastures. If you think of what's currently happening in the world, we see that we are fast track on a fast track towards this plague. The fires in Australia in the beginning of this year and the end of last year, the worst in history, a billion animals died. The fires currently in the United States of America and in California is out of control. Even Doug Batchelor's own house was a th in threat because of these fires. It shows that the sun is becoming hotter. Temperatures are rising more than ever before. That's why climate change is there, or what they're referring to as climate change, but we see it as the end of time. And all of this is laying the foundation for this plague. So the brooks will be dried up. There will be a famine, a great famine. No food, no water during this plague. The fifth plague, Revelation 16, 10 and 11. Darkness and pain on the throne of the beast. This is the same as the ninth plague in Egypt. During this time, Spirit of Prophecy tells us, God will write his law in the sky with the fourth commandment standing out that everyone is going to see it. That's going to be an amazing thing to see. The sixth plague, Revelation 16, 12 through 16. This is where the river Euphrates is dried up. And the preparation for the Battle of Armageddon takes place. Now, the Battle of Armageddon is a subject on its own, but it's basically the coming of Jesus. And Jesus fights the battle. 
If you turn to Revelation chapter 19, at the end of the chapter, where it talks about Jesus coming on a white horse and the armies and the angels with him, it's talking about him fighting, or the beast and the false prophet, fighting against Jesus and his army. So it's talking about this great battle, the battle of Armageddon. That's when Jesus comes. Because if you study the river Euphrates being dried up, the Bible tells us that this happened in the Old Testament because the city of Babylon was built upon the river Euphrates. Cyrus the Great came, and you can read it on the Cyrus Cylinder. You can also read it in the Bible. I'm going to give you a couple of texts now. Cyrus the Great diverted the river Euphrates and into channels, and the water came down, and they marched underneath the walls into the inner parts of the city. And when they came there, the gates into the city were not shut because the people were having a party. And that you can read in Daniel chapter 5, where the bloodless hand wrote on the wall. And Cyrus could march into the city, and Babylon fell in one night. So this is what it's referring to. And Cyrus came from the east as the anointed one of God. You can read that in Isaiah 41 verse 1 and 2. And it says that God opened before him the double doors so that the gates would not be shut. This was 150 years before Cyrus was born. This prophecy in Isaiah. And this is exactly what Cyrus wrote on the Cyrus Cylinder as to how he conquered Babylon. So this river Euphrates sitting underneath Babylon being dried up points to the fact that Babylon will lose its support. After God has written the law in the sky and pointed to the fourth commandment, people would realize under the fifth plague, the darkness on the throne of the beast, like just like, yeah, I almost gave an answer that I need to give at the end. Okay, the darkness on the throne of the beast. So the people will then turn on the beast. And that's the sixth plague. And the river Euphrates will be dried up, meaning because waters represents peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Revelation 17, 15. People will then turn on the beast. And therefore, they have to now spew these frogs, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, from their mouth to deceive the people again. They will have to do false miracles so that people can still follow them, even they now turning on them. And Alan White says that the people are going to turn upon the spiritual leaders that have deceived them, and now it is too late. That's the sixth plague, the preparation for the battle of Armageddon, which is the second coming of Jesus Christ. If you read the scriptures about the battle of Armageddon in Revelation 16, it talks about the battle, and then Jesus says, Behold, I come as a thief. And then it continues with how Jesus is going to come. So it has everything to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. The seventh plague, Revelation 16, 17 to 21, is the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is hail by the size of a talent, which is about 33 kilograms, falling upon the world. There's an earthquake that this world has never seen before. If you think about the earthquake that hit Indonesia in 2004, over 200,000 people died because of that earthquake, because of the tsunamis. What's going to happen when an earthquake comes that this world has never seen before? That's why the Bible says islands will flee away, meaning the tsunamis that's going to hit islands because of this earthquake will just devour these islands and they will not exist anymore. So this is the seventh plague. But the question is, does God want to do these plagues? Is this part of his ultimate will? And the answer is no. He does it because he needs to cleanse the world of sin and give to those who has persecuted God's people what they deserve, what they themselves have asked for. But Isaiah 21, 28-21 says that this is a strange work for God. This act is a strange act. Because in Ezekiel 33, 11, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? This is God's plan for humanity. And he's been preparing the world to choose his way. Because if you compare the seven last plagues with the seven trumpets, you would see that the seven trumpets have lots of similarities and symbols in them they are the same as the seven last plagues. But the seven trumpets are God's judgments poured upon the wicked mixed with mercy, meaning you can still turn to him. But the seven last plagues have no mercy. It's the fullness of God's wrath 
poured out upon the wicked. We can read that in Revelation chapter 15, the fullness of his wrath. So that's a basic summary of the seven last plagues. We've also looked at the seven sayings of Jesus upon the cross. Now let's look at the two reasons why you and I will not receive the seven last plagues. Reason number one, it is actually because of the seven sayings of Jesus upon the cross. Jesus first saying his ultimate forgiveness. And the first three sayings having to do with our relationship with humanity puts us in the place that we can have the same mind as Jesus and forgive as he has forgiven. Forgiveness is one of the prerequisites for us not to receive the plagues. The second reason is the salvation of souls. When Jesus pointed to the thief, surely today I say to you, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' people will so be in, in love with doing his work and reaching out to others that the salvation of souls would be an important uh, thing for them in the end of time, especially. The third, third saying of Jesus is not only will they be an example to those living in the world and to sinners, but they will be an example to those in the church, like Jesus pointed to his mother and John. We will be an example to people inside of the church. The last four sayings of Jesus related to his relationship with the Father. When he said, I thirst, thirsting for the Holy Spirit and the scriptures, God's people in the end of time will have a thirsting for the Holy Spirit to be like Jesus and to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The fifth saying of Jesus, when Jesus depended fully on God, God's people in the end of time will depend upon him fully. The sixth saying of Jesus, when he said, it is finished, God's people through the power of the latter rain will finish the work and the latter rain will empower them to go through the great time of trouble. The seventh saying of Jesus, the ultimate surrender of Jesus on the cross when he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. God's people in the end of time will be so surrendered to God's will that no matter what the sacrifice they would do it because the only safety, the only happiness in this life is within the center of God's will. Matthew 22, 37 to 39, Jesus summarizes these the sayings in what he said is the greatest commandments. When he said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and you shall love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And this, these are the two greatest commandments. When Jesus hung upon the cross, the first three commandments had to do with humanity, his relationship towards humanity. The last four sayings had to do with his relationship with the Father. Ultimate love, ultimate um, surrender and dependence upon God, and an ultimate love for your neighbor to reach out to them, whatever the cost. This will lead to being and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91 verse 1 and 2 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall, under abide, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. That's verse 1 and 2 of Psalm 91. Listen to verse 7 through 10. What is the context? Why do we need to abide? Why do we need to trust just like Jesus did on the cross? Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. The context of Psalm 91 is the very last days when the seven last plagues are falling. And we are protected from the seven last plagues because we have made God our dwelling place. How do we make him our dwelling place? We follow the seven steps, the seven sayings of Jesus upon the cross. Love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. That is the first reason why we will not receive the seven last plagues. The second reason, and this is powerful, and I don't want you guys to switch off. It's nine minutes to 12. Don't switch off. Listen carefully to this. 
What happened to Jesus on the cross so that you and I don't receive the same last plagues? This is absolutely amazing. The first plague, loathsome sores or boils like in Egypt. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 53 verse 5, but he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Why will I not receive the loathsome sores and the boils in the end of time when the seven last plagues fall? Because Christ's body was battered and bruised on my behalf on the cross. He took the first plague in my stead. Isn't that amazing? Second and third plague, the sea and the waters are turned to blood. Why do I not go through that? Why will my water be sure? Matthew 26 and verse 28. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. The reason I do not receive the second and third plague and why my water will be sure when I am in the mountains or in the desert or within the forest, wherever I'm fleeing to, when the seven last plagues are falling, is because Jesus took the second and third plague in my stead upon the cross when he shed his blood for me. The fourth plague, the famine, which is the sun scourging men and animals and the, the life and everything, the, the, the harvest and the trees and everything. Why? Why wouldn't I receive that plague? Because John 19, 21, when Jesus said, I thirst, his physical thirsting, he took the famine on my behalf. Therefore, Isaiah says, our water and our food will be our bread will be sure when we are in the mountains because jesus took it in my place you see what we don't understand is is that when sin came into this world the result the consequences was seven last plagues hellfire or let me put it this way there are actually three first death Seven last plagues, if you're alive, leading to the first death, and then the second death. That is the result of sin. But because of Christ and his sacrifice upon the cross, I don't have to receive the seven last plagues if I'm alive when Jesus comes. And I don't have to go through the second death because he took both in my stead. The only thing that I will face in this life, because I still did sin, is if I'm not alive when Jesus comes, is that I will face the first death, the death that everyone dies if Jesus doesn't come in my lifetime. It is interesting when the Bible talks about the 144,000 who will be alive when Jesus comes. In Revelation 7, verse 16 and 17, it says, They shall neither hunger anymore or thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them. You remember the plague we just looked at? The sun scorches men. Why do we, I do not receive it? Because Jesus thirsted and hungered in my place on the cross. Nor in, now I read it again, the sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So once again, the 144,000 will go through this because what Christ has done. The fifth plague, the darkness on the throne of the beast, which is the ninth plague in Egypt. Matthew 27, 45 and 46 says, now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour in the context of the cross, there was darkness all over the land. And both and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The reason why I don't receive this plague of darkness is because Jesus faced the darkness in my place. Faced the separation that humanity would experience from God if they do not repent and turn to him. He did it once again in my place. The sixth plague. The river is dried up, meaning the beast loses its support. Did Jesus take this plague in my place on the cross? Isaiah 63 and verse 3. I've trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. 
no support. Psalm 69 verse 20. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for com comforters, but I found none. Jesus tread the winepress alone. The Father had to turn his face. The Holy Spirit had to withdraw. The angels had to stand on a distance. And humanity forsook Jesus, even his own people, while he was on the cross. He went through this alone so that you, do not, you and I don't have to be alone during this, the sixth plague in the end of time. The seventh plague. Revelation 16, 17, when Jesus comes. Just before he comes, during the seventh plague, when the seventh bowl is poured out upon the world, listen to what Revelation says. Revelation 16, 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Jesus is coming. Michael is standing up for his people. His priestly robes are taken off. And his kingly robes are put on to come and fight for his people and set them free for eternity from this world of sin. He said, it is done in the seventh plague. And I can stand alive when Jesus comes. Because he said on the cross in John 19.30, it is finished. Jesus took the seven last plagues upon the cross so that I don't have to experience it in the end of time. My bread, my water will be sure. The Holy Spirit will still fill God's people and protect them. The wicked men will come with their weapons and it will fall and it will break. It will to do anything to us. Darkness will come in close. Give us his light so that we can face Jacob's trouble. And the final purging of God's people will take place so that they can be alive in Jesus' sight when he returns. But not a single plague will touch us because what the Son of God did upon the cross. My friends, I want to ask you today as we end off. Is the cross of Christ a reality in your life? Do you play with sin? Do you fornicate? Do you watch things that you shouldn't watch? Do you play with those things that you know are wrong and you haven't given it to Jesus? I beg of you, surrender it to Christ. Look to the cross, not only forgiveness, but look to the cross and find the power in the blood so that God can give you victory over these things. Jesus is coming soon and we work with a lot of people. Adultery is rampant in our church. Young men, so many of them, maybe even someone in this group today, are addicted to pornography, addicted to gaming, addicted to women, addicted to so many things in this world that the devil has placed upon this path. It is not too late for you to make that total surrender to Jesus and claim his power to have victory. Or else the seven last plagues that Jesus has taken will not count for you. It will not count for me. I will receive it if I do not repent and turn to him and see the beauty and the love of God in the cross. May God bless you. May he be with you as we make important choices in the final moments of earth's history. Amen.